Welcome everyone. We will get started in just a minute to allow um, additional participants to um, log in. It is great to have you with us this afternoon. All right, welcome to the Supporting Families and Their Children Virtually panel discussion. My name is Joanna Hightower and I am the founding partner at Innovages. We are an education consulting group focused on ensuring the continuity of learning for all students by building the capacity of schools, educators, and families to develop courageous and innovative solutions in K-12 education. We are so excited to have you all with us today and are looking forward to the important sharing we are going to do in the next hour on key considerations for supporting families and their children virtually. We know that in this time of COVID-19, many families are playing a larger role than ever before in their children's education. And we are hopeful that the ideas and considerations you hear about today will further your thinking and inform your planning as you embark on the rest of this very critical school year. Before we get started, I wanna share some reminders um, that will ensure our, our panel runs smoothly today. Um, please uh, ensure your microphone is muted, which I think is already happening by default. And if you have any questions for myself or the panelists, please use the chat box and um, I will make sure to answer or pose those questions towards the end of the session. Now, let's learn about the educators that are with us today. As I mentioned, I am Joanna Hightower, and for the last 16 years, I have served children and their families as a teacher, school principal, and charter school CEO in Philadelphia. Um, I'm also a working mom um, that has a seven-year-old who's learning from home as well, and a 16-month-old who I think is about 16 years old. Uh, and um, I'm a Temple Owl, so shout out to all of the owls out there. Um, and so. Um, I'm really excited uh, to um, introduce our panelists today. So before we get to know our panelists, um, I'm, sorry. Um, I'm joined by some amazing educators today. Uh, ladies, uh, please share with us um, a quick 60-second intro uh, about yourself so that we can get to know you. Um, let's start with Amanda. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Amanda Hamilton Roos. I'm a senior learning designer at Springboard Collaborative, um, and I specialize in family-facing materials. Um, over the past 20 years, I've taught in public schools and private schools and community centers. I've written hundreds of pages of literacy curriculum, articles on family engagement, and letters to school boards. But I've also sat at the kitchen table and battled homework with my three children. Um, and I know the angst of seeing your child struggle to learn how to read. Um, so for me, the, the work of virtually supporting uh, schools and families and helping them work together is both personal and professional, and I'm eager to help others do the same. Um, uh, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, it is great to have you with us today. I'm excited for everything that you're gonna share with us. 
Um, next, let's hear from Nadine. Hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here today. Um, um, I'm Nadine Rousnier. Um, I'm an education consultant. I've been working in New York City schools for over 21, 25, over 25 years now. Started off as a classroom teacher, did that for about 12 years or so. Started my doctoral work at Teachers College, Columbia University. Spent about 10 years there, not only studying and learning, but participating as a lecturer, supervising students teachers, really amazing experience there. When I uh, graduated with my doctorate, I made the transition into uh, consulting and I've been an educational consultant for about 13 years now and um, I just love being in schools, working with kids, teachers, administrators, parents, families. Um, as a parent myself, um, of two boys. I just really enjoy the work I've been doing even so more so as late with parents in uh, workshops and webinars and connecting the, in, in those ways. All right, Nadine, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We're super excited to have you. Uh, let's hear from Glendora. Hi there. And just as an aside, I see that uh, Jennifer is there, but we can't see her, just so so that you're aware. Anyway, my name is Glendora Tremper, and I am a special education coordinator for Spring Charter Schools at this time. I start out as speech language pathologist in the school system. It's probably been my third profession. I've gone through a couple of different reiterations of my life. Uh, but I finally got into education uh, as a speech language pathologist, moved into the administrative portion as a special education coordinator in a traditional setting, then moved to the charter school uh, system, which uh, with Springs Charter Schools. And that's what I'm doing now as a special education coordinator. Uh, but I've also been involved, uh, like everybody else, as a parent with a stay at home child. Luckily for me, my child now is in college, so I don't have the same worries as some of the other parents have, which is trying to get a little child in front of the computer. Uh, he does that on his own, probably too much. Uh, but then I've also been on board. So I was uh, uh, on the board of a traditional um, uh, school district, Chula Vista Elementary School District, voted in. And then I'm now presently on a board for another charter school, uh, Bayfront Mueller Charter School. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about what they're doing, too, as well as what we're doing here at Springs Charter School. So, you know, my focus is special education, but really it's all all students are all of ours. So it's uh, really makes no difference which group we focus on, because we really have to think of all of them as a whole. I'm pleased to be here. It's great to have you. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, all kids, it's about all kids all the time. Um, so let's hear from Jennifer. I see her in the participants list, but looks like something's not going well. All right, Jennifer, we hope you can join us soon um, by joining the presenter side. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let's get to the important topic for today. And that is key considerations for supporting families and their children virtually. Um, and there is no time more important than right now in our education um, where we need to um, have as much information and tools in our toolbox to do this well. So panelists, I have a series of questions that I will be asking. I will kick off the question to one of you based on your areas of expertise. You have about five or so minutes to share with us and you can absolutely share your screen and resources if you would like. So let's get started. All right, we're gonna kick this off to Amanda. This year, the role of families in the learning process has taken a whole new life. What roles do families play in accelerating learning with their children? Great. Well, I will happily uh, answer that question. Let me just get my screen up and ready to go. Um, can everybody see that? Oh. 
Um, okay. Well, um, so I'm Amanda Hamilton Roos. Once again, thank you very much for having me here. And I'm, I'm representing Springboard Collaborative uh, today. Uh, Springboard Collaborative is a, a literacy nonprofit that helps children develop the necessary literacy skills they need uh, to access all of life's opportunities. Our, our mission is to close the opportunity gap uh, by closing the gap between home and school. And to answer this question, I'm gonna rely heavily on the research that's been synthesized um, and the experience of our friends at over at the Flamboyant Foundation. And they've identified, um, here's the little graphic from them. Uh, they've identified- I think your, um, your screen share went away. So you might wanna try that one more time for us. Oh, nuts. Okay, hold on. Let me try again. There, can you see it now? I'm, oops, okay, great, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so our friends at the Flamboyant Foundation, uh, they've identified five roles uh, that, families, uh, that families play that can accelerate student learning, right? So the first one is communicating high expectations. Uh, the second one is monitoring uh, their child's performance. Um, right, so uh, regularly checking in with them and with their teacher, supporting learning at home. Uh, so that's, you know, helping children at home and, and reinforcing the learning that's happening in school. And then also guiding their, their uh, child's education. So this includes from pre-K to college, but also um, the, the year two, um, as well as guiding like how they're doing in school and then advocating for their child. So families who advocate for their children uh, to, to make sure that their children get the, the personal uh, support and attention that they need to be successful in school. So we know that identifying these roles is really not enough. We've got to support families as they work to fulfill these roles. And especially in a virtual environment, this support is crucial. So we have a framework um, that we use to, uh, to support families in this work, and it's called the Family Educator Learning Accelerator, or FILA for short. Um, and it's a simple six-step approach that underlies all of our programming. Um, as families participate in this accelerator, they get the tools and resources they need to play these five essential roles and accelerate their child's literacy. So for example, uh, number one, you can see says build your team. So the FILA begins with a one-to-one -one meeting between the teacher and the family. This is an opportunity for teachers to share valuable information that can help families more effectively guide their child's education, like you know um, milestones and, and grade level expectations. Um, and it's also an opportunity for families uh, it's an opportunity for teachers to listen to families as they communicate their high expectations, their hopes and dreams for their child, and also advocate for what their child needs. The FILA is powered by goal setting and data. So in the second step, uh, we assess where the child begins. And in the third step, we set a goal. And then in the fifth and sixth step, um, we celebrate the child's growth. Inviting families into the process of assessing where their students are and, and setting a goal for where we want them to go by the end of the FILA really helps families communicate those high expectation and effectively monitor their child's progress. Now in the middle of the FILA, uh, children practice the skills they need to reach their literacy goals. So they practice with their teacher, they practice with an adult at home, they practice on their own, and then the whole team uh, teacher, families, and children come together and practice for a family workshop, which you can see the little tool icon there um, is where that happens. And these specific types of practice help families monitor and support their child's progress effectively during the FILA, and then to guide their child's literacy growth overall with confidence. Because families are closely involved, um, in their family, in their child's literacy practice. The FILA methodology also promotes advocacy. Um, so if you, we notice that a goal or strategies are not working, families are empowered to have conversations that could lead uh, to their child receiving, you know, tier two or three intervention services, for example. So not only 
does this, uh, let me arrange my window so I can see everybody. Uh, not only does this framework itself support families in taking these five roles, but individual components of the FILA um, also help families in these roles. So for example, one of the practice steps is family workshops. So um, the family workshop is an opportunity, right, for the whole team, families and teachers and children come together and practice a literacy strategy. So we know it's it's not enough just to encourage people to read with home, read at home with their child. If if neither the parent nor the child knows how to improve a reading skill like comprehension, um, mere aspiration or, or motivation it is not going to be enough. So in the family workshop, we make literacy instruction very family friendly. We break down the literacy strategy into to actionable steps uh, that the teacher can then model and, and be really specific. We give families questions that they can ask at home to promote um, academically centered conversations. And then the families have a chance to practice right there with support um, from the teacher. And then finally, the group reflects and, and problem solves together. So these family workshops are, it's a dual capacity building practice. Families learn from the teacher and from each other. Teachers learn from families about how reading is going at home and they gain new insights on best how to instruct the children and, and they form real partnerships. And these partnerships extend beyond the classroom, right? Because families learn from and support each other. Family workshops can energize a school community and create a culture where all families work together to advocate and guide and, and support their children. So after participating in family workshops, families are ready to facilitate practice time at home and support the learning at home. And do they ever? Um, we at Springboard Families uh, read an incredible um, almost three million minutes this summer. Um, and it's not just the, the quantity of reading, we also um, help to improve the quality of reading at home. So you can see that 94% of families here at the, at the bottom of the slide um, say that they learn strategies that help their children learn outside of school. So talk about being able to um, play the role of supporting your child. And not only that, families also have new confidence in talking about literacy instruction and what their child needs. So they're able to effectively advocate for their child and, and work with their child's teacher this year and then also future teachers. For example, this is a picture of uh, Mr. David Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams was a parent in our Springboard program. He knew his child was struggling, but he wasn't sure what help his child needed or even how to help. And he, you know, in his own words says, I just wasn't getting anywhere. After participating in the FILA, he said, now I can go up to his teacher and I can say, you know, he's struggling with fluency or he's not decoding right. And then the two of them can really help David's son um, accelerate in his reading. So although we use FILAs for K to four literacy, we believe FILAs can work in all contexts and could really move with the parent and child as they move across grade levels, all the way even up to college. Families could guide a child's education throughout their schooling career. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second, if I can. There we go. So, um, you know, right now being a parent is tough and um, supporting the virtual learning of their ch child is, is a daunting task. But if we as educators can give families a clear roadmap uh, to follow like the FILA, then we can give them the, the tools and resources they need to really uh, play these crucial roles in their child's academic life. And I will drop our website in the chat for those who are interested in learning more, but um, I want to make sure that my fellow panelists have plenty of time, so I'll, I'll pass the mic. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was super, super helpful. Um, learned a lot about the FILA. We have Jennifer who has joined us. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself to the group really quickly? Um, yes, of course. Sorry. This is like the world we live in, right? Tech issues. Um, I was able to log on, though. so. Thank goodness. <laughs> Hi, Jennifer Hall. I am uh, the 
Special Pedagogy Specialist at the Collaborative for Inclusive Education in New York City. Um, our collaborative works with uh, charter schools throughout independent and big CMOs throughout the city. Uh, we provide professional development. I specifically provide development on multilingual learner programs and uh, consult with schools. I'm happy to be here. I've been working with multilingual learner students and communities for almost 10 years. Um, as soon as I graduated college, I knew that's the community I wanted to work with. I have taught um, in lots of different capacities. I've been a classroom teacher abroad in Guatemala at a dual language international school. I've served as an L itinerant teacher for the National Public School District. And then prior to joining the collaborative, I worked as an L coordinator for a charter school in Phoenix um, that had a really large L population, as you can imagine, living in Phoenix. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We are glad you could join us. Uh, we're going to continue with our panel questions, and we're going to launch this one to Nadine. Nadine, as educators, we are often focused on implementing SEL effectively with our students. With all of the challenges the pandemic has brought to all of us, many schools have now deployed wellness teams within their schools to also provide SEL to their staff. How do we expand this support to families? Mute, my Sorry about that. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, focusing in on how we expand that support uh, around SEL to families. Um, interestingly enough, um, I've over the 13 years I've been working as an education consultant um, and working with teachers and supporting teachers and implementing their practices and also working with administrators, students, and parents. Um, I've done workshops, certainly in schools over the years, Focus on various things, you know, listening into Amanda um, on some of the great work that she's doing with 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 parents and families around literacy. You know, it, it was reminiscent to some of the work that I've done in the past with with families. Um, all, but what I'd like to share today is how some of my work has really transformed. And addressing your question, Joanna, um, some of the work I've done around SEL with teachers with children in schools over the years, I've done kind of piecemeal, I'd say, in in workshops over the years with parents. But now, since the pandemic, there has become such a need for families for that extra support around social emotional learning. So one of the things that I have to say I'm really excited about, and I've, I've really found to be um, very uh, just enriching work is, is reaching out to families and conducting webinars, which obviously work very well these days. And this started for me in the spring where some of the schools I've worked with asked me to continue some of the work I've been doing with families, but do that through webinars and focus really very um, closely in on social emotional learning. So what I've done was I created a series of webinars around social emotional learning for families parents, caregivers, parent coordinators, really all, all members of schools and districts that could use this support. Um, and many of the topics came around topics that the families themselves said they would really like support around. So uh, very often in connecting with districts and parent coordinate, coordinators, parent liaisons, we came up with topics and even surveys of parents, topics that really made sense to them. And what was really exciting about the work to me and has continued to be is that constant communication and collaboration we've had and just to implement a series of webinars so that we meet on a regular basis we can form relationships and, and trust and ongoing communication so for instance this summer I partnered with a school and um, and district in the Bronx um, and we met weekly we actually met twice a week over the months of the summer and we got to know each other really well and it was like enriching relationships and communication that we began to know each other very well and it was a, 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 an opportunity to come together for learning and discussion and we all um, 
we all kind of took part and learned from each other and had the opportunity to, to kind of zero in on topics that were really important to them. I'd like to, to share my screen for a moment so that I could share with you um, some of the topics. And again, let me just uh, again reiterate, many of these topics, really I should say all of these topics grew out of what the schools and districts we have have wanted as topics what parents really wanted to focus in on um and i kind of created the webinars and the resources around the topics that were meaningful to them and i continually as i continue this work that i started in the spring i add on more and more topics as we go all around social emotional learning and the topics that are meaningful to parents and and schools and and uh, parent coordinators um, families in general. And as you can see, um, one of our, our top uh, topics is behavior man management strategies. And very often I would focus in on one of these topics for even um, a series of sessions. So we might have two or three sessions around behavior management strategies. Um, you know, I've met recently with um, schools and districts and we focus in on on equity and cultural culturally responsive practices and we have a series around this one topic we have a series of of, of sessions or meetings around this topic um, also fostering a growth mindset and managing the challenges of covid as you can see the rest i'll just scroll down i'm going to also include this in the chat the link so you could access this if, if you like um, we focused in also on topics again of parents families um, of choice, of, of their choices, of some of these topics um, around, um, you know, a, a literacy and developing emotional intelligence through intelligence through books, uh, supporting your child as a reader and such, and even around developing healthy habits, navigating the digital world. So um, I will put this, and you see I have my contact information there. Also, I'm going to switch my screen back. I'm going to put that in right now uh, and post that in the chat so you could access that um, also if you would like. And um, along with those workshops, those webinars, I should say, um, I often, uh, I always offered many resources then and um, so parents could afterwards visit and check out websites and um, uh, websites, videos, articles, I would connect that with those as well. And uh, last but not least, I don't want to take too much time. Um, the focus was on the learning. Yes, I, off I always had PowerPoints to present with information, but it was very much about communication where we come together and then have discussions uh, about this. And I I'll often, um, you know, we would talk about how um, this was like a judgment free zone. We're all here to kind of feel free to have discussions, no judgment, posing issues. I like to to have a, a, a portion of the webinars called tricky situations where parents, families would be feel free to, to share issues around the topic of a choice and kind of get input where we could all share. And I often did that myself, share situations that came up around the topic that I've encountered, how I reacted to it, um, you know, different ways that I might have and, and have the group share that as well. So it was a great opportunity to, um, to connect over this and really connect with the topics that, stood, that the children uh, have been learning in school as well to continue on and make the connections around social emotional learning um, uh, you know and it's certainly those competencies around self-awareness social awareness self-management and relation relationship skills and responsible decision making so carrying that and connecting that to what's going on in schools thank you thank you so much Nadine Building relationships with families is so, so important um, for many reasons, uh, but right now it's just a critical time to build those relationships um, that can really promote student growth um, and um, just keep folks sane, right? And this is just this very challenging time for all. Um, and so I want to launch over to Jennifer, um, you know, with her expertise around multilingual learners and you know um, what strategies can schools use to communicate and build relationships with multilingual learners right because that's a really targeted space um, we'd love to hear from you yes thank you 
Um, first, I want to just say thank you to any school leaders, any teachers who are uh, on live right now and who will be watching later and truly have such, you know, a hard job right now. And um, I thank you. You're in the trenches doing it and um, just keep going. I know it's hard. Um, multilingual learner families right now, communication with them is is vital. and. You know, along with them being our co-teachers, as all families are right now, um, the language barrier is difficult. In the brick and mortar, it was already difficult for many schools to navigate, you know, how do we communicate with families? Um, but even more so now, so many barriers are kind of thrown up. You know, how do we communicate with our families that don't speak English? Um, I actually am going to share in the chat right now. I don't know if it will. Oh, it did show up. Um, so this is an acronym I came up with with my colleague and director of the collaborative, Melissa Katz, and this is kind of the five areas that we like to look at when we're thinking of communicating and engaging with our families, um, especially our multilingual learner families. And so I wanted to start, you know, as I share these strategies with you all, I wanted to start with and work through this acronym. So starting with connecting with MIL families, that C in care. So when we're connecting with our families, we really want to get to know our families. Um, are, what are their linguistic needs? Do they have migrant or refugee status? Are they SIFE students? Have they experienced trauma from um, their previous country? Um, this is really going to help a school determine what their needs are for not only the students, but the families instructionally and emotionally. Um, some specific ways that you really can connect with your kids and learn about them. Digital surveys. Um, if they don't have a computer, reach out through phone calls video conferencing chats um, for all of these strategies an interpreter might be needed but tap the shoulder of your bilingual staff uh, first um, today I met with a school uh, an independent school uh, it was Inwood and they have such a plethora of bilingual staff that they are utilizing right now to connect with families it was so nice to see that not only were they connecting through the screen, but also connecting through language. So that was really, really nice. Um, so there's one school that's really doing that well. Um, and if you can't, if you don't have any staff that speak your family's home language, then you can outsource an interpreter. Many school districts around um, the country, they offer free interpreters um, through the public school districts, and they often offer that free to as well. It just kind of depends. You have to look at your policies um, in your school districts. Um, moving on to the A in my acronym CARE, and that stands for alerting families to important information. It's, again, so important. We're getting new regulations day by day. I just got an email that um, our mayor is actually closing schools um, and they are going remote but not charter schools um, so but who knows how long that's going to last right as tr transmission rates rise so communicating these important information these closings are we going remote are we going back in person we're constantly communicating with our families um, but how do we communicate with our families that need that language access so some ideas there are, um, you know, ask first, how do your families prefer to receive their communication? Do they prefer it through phone? Is it email? Is it text messaging? You know, ask your families which language they prefer to communicate in. Um, some will find it surprising that many of our multilingual learner families might say English. Um, also, use your school home online um, or home to online communication platform like Parent Class Dojo, those really big platforms already have a built-in translation system. So when you communicate in English to your families, they can choose to receive that communication in the language that they prefer. Um, those tend to cost money. Some really easy ways for teachers and educators um, that are a little bit more cost-effective um, platforms would be like Talking Points, Blooms, Remind. I'm actually going to drop these in the chat right now. So if you haven't heard of these platforms, these are really great. You can connect them to your phone. They have apps. It's a really great way to quickly get out information. Maybe you have an update on a student that you really want to communicate to families quickly. Um, 
even if it's just a nice message of like, your student did such a really great job today um, through, you know, Nearpod um, in our Google Meets today. It goes such a long way. Um, but these are really, really great platforms to use and teachers, they're very, very user friendly, <laughs> I promise. All right, another thing to consider also is get with your tech person at your school. Um, you can actually add Google Translate to your school website. So when parents log on, maybe they are looking for an announcement. Maybe they want to you know, look at the calendar. They can actually receive that visual in their home language, but um, you have to add it. Um, so I would get with your tech person. I do have a doc and I'll drop it in a second that actually walks you step by step how to add Google Translate to your school website. Um, it was made a couple years ago, so I'm not sure if there's some changes or updates in that. Um, so definitely share that with your tech person at your school and I'll drop that when I'm all right, so the R in CARE stands for regarding our families as partners in learning. And again, our families are our co-teachers right now, right? Especially for our younger ones that have to do school online. It's really our parents that are logging them on, right? So hold how-to events on the school platform your school is using, whether that's Zoom, Google Meet. Um, teach them how to use Nearpod if that's what you're using. Teach your parents how to use Pear Deck, Google Jamboard, whatever it is you're using. Um, show them how to use it so then when a student finds difficulty with the platform or, you know, maybe they forgot how to navigate, you know, where their assignment is, their parents will know and will be able to help them. Um, so how-to events are really, really great. Also, what you could do is have it posted on YouTube in a private channel if parents can't or families cannot make it. And then what families can do is actually take advantage of that closed captioning and then they can receive the whole virtual event, how to event in their home language. So that's a really, really great way to kind of navigate translating instead of hiring an interpreter. Um, just post it on a private YouTube channel for your school. Um, and then they can receive that communication in their home language. Um, working down through my acronym. Um, also, hold family literacy and math science events still. They can be virtual. You can still share those tips with families on how they can support their child um, through language development at home. Um, and again, if they can't make it live to an event, post it on a private YouTube channel. I actually saw a school um, that I'm going to shout out right now, actually live here in the session, Voice. Um, I actually met with them not too long ago um, about their multilingual learner programming. They actually have really tried since distant lear distance learning has happened to connect with their families and they're holding um, events and they've also even added office hours um, virtually for families to just pop in and ask questions if they have any concerns. So um, shout out to you all, really such a great um, way to connect with your families in this virtual world. Um, finally, the E in our acronym, we can't do this all. So the E stands for engaging in community partnerships, right? So. Um, we really need to consider offering our organizations free space in our virtual schools to encourage them to bring their services closer to your families. Um, ask your families which organizations they think would make good partners for the school community, um, which is issues are of concern to them. Um, invite members from the school community to inform um, parents about their services, such as you know, a local librarian, a nurse, or even an immigration activist, um, especially if you have undocumented families. And we wanna make sure that we're bringing those resources to them as well. And they may not be as forthright, you know, to tell you that they're undocumented. Um, so that's where it really becomes important that maybe you have um, a contact in your school that speaks a similar or same home language as these families um, that they can trust and, um, open up to because right now um, getting services to families is really hard. Um, so we really need to be bringing them to them in this virtual space. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention too is um, if you have families 
um, that are willing to volunteer and maybe you create an ambassador program and you have um, your families give new families virtual tours of the school. Um, they can kind of walk those new families through, you know, what virtual school is like um, in th that family's home language. What should their child expect? What should you expect as a family in terms of scheduling? What might you need? Um, so that's really important too. Um, but those are just some quick strategies. And I, I really thank you all for giving me this platform to share some ideas. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I'm confident that everyone got a wealth of strategies on what or how to support our multilingual learners and families. Um, and so I want to wrap up with a question for Glendora. What successful strategies have you seen to support the social emotional needs of students virtually? Um, so we've heard a lot from our panelists of things you can do. How have you really focused in on, you know, how do we do this all virtually in a very effective way? So I am going to share a screen also. And what um, I find so much so fun, right? And this is the whole purpose of this is all these sharing ideas. There's so many ideas. And I will tell you that when I went and I reached out because I know what I do. But of course, um, I started out and I joined this through Springs Charter Schools because my superintendent said, hey, Glendora, you should do this. And when your superintendent says, you do, right? We know that. But then I thought, I'm also on a board of a charter school and I know they're doing lots of wonderful things. So what did I do? I reached out, you know, uh, to them and I said, okay, so what is it you're doing? And the list is endless for both. And this is what I'm saying. There's so many things that we do and we just have to keep on sharing. And that's what I do between the two organizations that I work with and with any other organization. And that's why I love these kinds of conferences because you know, there's little things that we go, oh, that's, that works for my population. That works for my need at this time or next time. So um, yeah, I just love that whole idea, the YouTube private for the trans. I hadn't even thought about that. that's really good. And something else that somebody else mentioned that I thought, oh yeah, that's right. I've got to think about that. And I put little, little notes, but so what we did is I wanted to share a couple of things that we did. Uh, one of them was during the summer because we um, at Springs already do a lot of online, a lot of homeschooling. So we already had some of those connections in place. And even when we went, uh, when we first, COVID first hit, we actually were able to transfer quite quickly into providing uh, education and even special ed services, even though we were technically not in school. However, we got concerned uh, about, you know, the summer break, right? Because even though that we had connections, they were tenuous, you know, and then we wanted to confirm. So what we, um, somebody mentioned something to me and all of a sudden it sparked in my mind, well, we could do something because I'm also on the um, Medi-Cal um, group, you know, the money that we get, the, the, the funding that we get. So I thought, well, why don't we do a camp, a virtual camp for their students? And so that's what we did. But one of the things that was really important here is I didn't want it to be a therapeutic issue because already we were having difficulties with kids attending for their speech therapy, their their uh, counselor services and stuff like that. But I wanted it to be to be fun. Now, I did this very quick. I did this like three weeks before the end of school. But so who could I reach out? So I reached out to my counselors. I reached out to the um, school psychologists and actually I have one OT that was ended up being part of this. Would you be willing to do this as I put this together? So their focus was we want to have something that makes sure that those our students have a connection, right, with somebody outside of their home and that it, it um, is fun and it doesn't make them feel like they're working even though we're giving them the strategies, right, about mindfulness, even though we're giving them the, you know, communication strategies, all those, but it has to be something that they want to do. So we, we just did this, it was only one day a week. We tried to string it out for the whole summer. Again, it's a, it's a reason to connect. And they did things like, you know, mindfulness, you know, breathing. And then they also did interactive um, things like the butterflies that you see there. They would send the information to the parents ahead of time. Let's get this all together. And then they created. I And, and the other thing that was fun about this is that we just had, um, we did it by grade level. 
And so that way there could have been, because we have many different um, sites and we're all over the place, but that way actually connected kids with other kids that they may never have had a connection with because they're not in the same place. So that was really fun. And then I just wanted to share, this is what one parent said. Um, and as I said, this was not just for special ed students, students with special ed uh, services. It was for everybody and anybody. But this parent happened to be uh, a child with a child with special needs. And her point was the fact that the child had something to look forward to. It supported his need for social skill development. And it also, you know, he's not generous uh, with compliments, but he had nothing but nice words about the camp. So, you know, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're all looking for is getting that feedback from the parent because the parents then feel supported because they can't do it all for their children. So they need us to, to give them as much support as we can. So this is something that is, we're, you know, we'd like to see again, you know, in the summer, next summer, see if we could do that, whether or not we're back in school, right? Because it, there were so many good things about it that they could do. So we're, we're, we're looking at that. But then what do we do for, um, you know, day to day? Basically is what you all have mentioned, all the other panelists have mentioned, they're just multiple and varied we ways of doing it. We have to do it daily, weekly, whenever it's needed. And that all means all. And, you know, it's not just the teachers, it's not just the administrators or the counselors or the special ed staff, but it's everybody. And I included students because I'm gonna give you an example of the high school of the kinds of things that they're doing. They themselves are support for the, the for the other students and for um and, and for the um the parents too. I mean I always find that if you support supporting students, you're supporting the parents, really, in that sense. But this is an example that I just took from uh, from the different, you know, I, everybody has this. They have different kinds of uh, websites, different kinds of pages that they have. You know, you have some like this this one uh, counselor has it, which they share with everybody. And these kinds of things are shared through the uh, principal welcome letter, teachers letters, weekly letters. And you can see what we want to do is have resources for for the parents you know whatever they whatever they may be they have them um, they have virtual uh this is from riverside right so it's very specific to our area up there um, we also she has calming rooms and different ideas in which to support um you know to support the children so something that people can get access to right parents get access to uh, and then actually also what they uh, have of course which is always very important is that communication there uh, the, the fact that they can communicate directly with the individual um, you know the way it's presented makes a difference right some parents some students you know this this whole visual the little um, um, gosh I'm just blanking out on the name you know with the little I've got one of these Bitmojis, the Bitmoji classrooms, right? It, it's fun. And then you they have links to whatever they are. It makes it a little bit easier. I'm not going to go because I can see it's taking a little bit of time to, to access it, but I've got links to all of these that parents can just click on to different things that they can, they have questions about. This is a picture right here with the Bitmojis, just one page of a series of pages that this counselor did. And then of course they do social emotional learning videos. The key thing that we have found with our kiddos and our family is that they like seeing the people, the actual individuals that they're used to working with, right? It makes it personal. They they know, but then they also do it in a fun way through uh, scavenger hunts and stuff like that. So it's all a matter of that connection. Let's do it in a fun way to engage them. Somebody mentioned about engagement, getting them involved, right? Doing that. Um, so, you know, these are some examples of the kinds of things that we do. Oops, sorry. And then here are some examples that I took from the Bayfront. And when I'm, I show here a picture of associated student body, those are the students that are doing, and they've created this link crew is what they call it. So the ninth grader, the 11th and 12th grade students are mentoring the ninth grade students, reaching out to those students, making sure that they, you know, it's their first year of high school in this very strange environment. How can we make sure they feel connected? Um, we, you know their their uh instagram of course this is more for the high schoolers so instagram is really popular all those kinds of things and you know again resource centers that they have for the parents um for the parents and then of course we're doing the same thing the way we're supporting families just calling them 
Let's call them. Give them that phone call. Because sometimes a lot of people, this technology is fun. A lot of people are doing it. But so for some people, it doesn't work. So let's give them a call. And what we do do at Bayfront is they actually, for those parents, students that they've not been able to connect with, they actually go home. They go physically to the home to visit with them. They go and they check. That's part of the sort of the, uh, for this Bayfront Charter, it has to do with, that's what we do. We do every year, every parent gets visited by the teacher. So though they're not doing that this year, they did that virtually. But for those hard to reach parents, those parents or students, they're not connecting. They're actually going out, physical distancing, making sure all that's taken care of. But they're, they're you know, that's what they're doing. And then one last thing I wanted to share again, there's so many ideas and I'm sure, oh, I know I've forgotten a lot of things that they've told me. I haven't had time to put it in, but I wanted to share this one because I, this is something that um, I received an email from one of the programs, from one of the site facilitators at one of the schools at Springs. And she was just checking with the teachers. Now I get that this is teachers, but it's the same thing because oftentimes, at least in on Springs, a lot of our teachers are the families of those students that are coming, attending to our site. So, but you can use this because I've got staff that are using it for uh, checking in with students, not necessarily maybe these questions, but checking with students, checking with parents. And the fun thing about this is that you can do this very simply, right? As I say, I, I just cribbed this directly from this other person that did it, I asked her permission, she said, go ahead. And then, but what happens is that I've got this connected. So when I send this out weekly to my staff, just checking in with them, how they're doing, I get an email if somebody responds, because I'm giving them a choice to how you're doing, but I need a check in, I'm overwhelmed, I need support, let's schedule a hangout or call me SAP, I need to talk. So they can do that in an instant. I get that. And then because it, it, it dings on my phone, on my computer, I can then reach out to them and then I keep track. And then as you can see, I've got this uh, form here, top right hand. It just basically gives me an idea. I'm doing for the majority. They're doing pretty well, you know, feeling mad, but doing OK. I think that's the majority. I think that's the best we can hope sometimes is that we're just like handling it. And but then I did have a couple. A couple of feet uh, struggling, need a quick check in, overwhelmed and need support. So, and then I just keep track of it. This is just, I'm the only one that sees this. Nobody else does, but at least I know I can keep a pulse on to what my staff is, how they're feeling and make sure that I respond to them right away. And this is how some teachers are reaching out to, to their parents and making sure that they're keeping track because there's so much happening. The more we can control and keep something that we can refer back to is helpful. So, I mean, those were just some ideas. We have some uh, principals that are doing stories plus attaching um, some activities that the students can do um, with it. Um, we did Dia de los Muertos for uh, we have a bilingual program. So that was really appropriate. Plus they connected with another school that is in an environment that has a lot of uh, Spanish speaking parents. So they did a, a read a, the principal read a story. They did the, I've forgotten the name of it, where the, you can see the book and the, and, the, and the principal talking, reading the story. And then the art teacher from the other school site actually showed them how to do a drawing of a, uh, um, um, I want to say calabaza, and that's not right. The 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 head, the oh my gosh, I can't think of it. You know what I'm saying? The skull. That's what I'm talking about. So anyway, lot a lot of ideas. It has to be fit your population, but we have to remember one way doesn't work for all, and we just have to keep on trying different things, and then hopefully, well, we do know that eventually one of them does create that connection with that family, and then they get that support because. It's that connection, that interpersonal connection, that communication, which is so key right now. That's it. Thank you. Oops, let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. I think it was Calavera. Calavera, yes, that was it. <laughs> I want to say Calabaza, and I'm like, no, oh, Calavera. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, we have about a few minutes. If there are any folks that have any questions for our panelists, 
please place those in the chat so I'll give some think time, right, and some good old quality wait time. Um, if you all have any questions that you want to ask um, anyone on the panel today. You know, I just wanted to mention, I'm trying to see if I can find it. I think, Jennifer, you probably, because you use YouTube a lot. What is the name of that link that they can put? Because when you're doing any kind of links to make sure that you, you delete the, um, delete the, um, any kind of ads or it doesn't go off into another YouTube. Do you know what I'm thinking about, Jennifer? Because that's the problem that teachers often have, right? With using YouTube. Yeah, I think you have to become like a subscriber, so then you 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 don't necessarily have to watch the ads. So that might that might be it. Um. No, actually, this is a this is a I believe this is a freebie. It's not a it doesn't cost. Let me see if I can find out while we're asking, wondering for questions because I think that's really helpful for all for anybody that's using you know YouTube, which is can be very helpful. But just just add, oh, I'm sorry. And while you're, you're uh, following up on that, uh, just to add, I find one of the silver linings, so to speak, of all of what we're, we're living with right now is that connecting with families in some ways is easier, which is almost a surprising consequence because I know for myself, I'm a parent of a high school student. I am getting to more PTA meetings and SLT meetings and, and you know, conversation with the principal than ever before. And I found with the work, the webinars I'm giving, we're, we're giving, getting amazing turnout because all parents have to do is turn on their phone, open up their laptop. And I think it's, it's just a fabulous opportunity to connect and communicate with parents. Whereas in, in, you know, previous to the pandemic, it was harder to, for, for parents in, in their busy lives to actually get to a place for a, for a workshop or some kind of um, meeting to, to, to connect. But now we can, and I think this is going to be the wave of the future, the communication in, with parents through webinars and such. I, I found an amazing response to parents so happy to have the opportunity to connect more regularly. So that, that's just a happy consequence, I think, looking for you know the positives in, in all of this. Agreed. Uh, yes, I cannot agree more um, about, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to use um, everything we've learned from the pandemic and from going virtual uh, and, you know, um, to really think about equity um, moving forward and access mm -hmm. and rethinking, not reopening schools, but rethinking education um, as we move forward with our children. Um, so. I want to wrap up. Um, today's conversation has been just uh, so, so informative uh, with so many strategies. I want to thank our panelists who have dedicated their time and expertise to supporting educators from across the globe and understanding some key considerations for supporting families uh, and their children virtually. We appreciate you and we are truly thank you for your contributions. Um, and so I just want to also just wrap up with saying at Innovages, we're here to support you as well. We are your partners um, and we'd love to hear um, more from you and would love to work with you. So keep us in mind. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn. So thank you again to our panelists and thank you all for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a wonderful holiday um, and best of luck um, as you embark on the rest of the school year and let 2021 be a better year than 2020. Um, thank you everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.